Hey everybody, John Abdo here, author of Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo. In this episode, I want to start introducing you to more audio clips from the book. They're presets on my computer, text-to-speech, Alex is his name, so excuse that. But I was fortunate enough early in my research to find Milo's father, a man by the name of Diotimus, a fascinating man, got some great stories about the maturing Diotimus in Wolves of Croton, and I think you'll be very inspired about Milo's genetic upbringing, who were his influencers, and at the same time, how did this man become the strongest man on the planet, and he's held that title for over 2,500 years. So sit back and enjoy some of the text-to-speech audio portions of Wolves of Croton, the untold story of Milo, in particular, Diotimus, the father of Milo of Croton. Wolves of Croton, the untold story of Milo, volume one, chapter nine, Wander Boy. Another anim lapses in the jaws of slavery. The harvest had been the most bountiful since I began slaving the valley. But as our drivers were reaping the rewards from our labors, for us, it was just slavery, totally devoid of any gratuities. And yet for Diotimos, the productiveness of the valley was an achievement. The boy was proud to be part of such a successful operation. He played a major role in transforming the barren landscapes into fields sprouting assortments of healthy cash crops. He baited and prided the valley animals, which had once been slower, smaller, and weaker forcing them to adapt to his persistent antagonizations. As such, all the stock saw heftier portions of meat clinging to their bones, and produced greater quantities of prosperous byproducts. As a result of their flourishing operations, the medians gained an opportunity to expand their commerce from local regions into international territories, and along with myself and a band of other slaves, Diotimos was chosen to work exports, delivering valley goods to foreign land and sea trade destinations. All over again, it was like trusting him with a knife in the slaughterhouse. I was dumbfounded as to how the medians had come to a decision that would allow the boy to wander beyond the borders of the valley. If anyone was to defect, or at least had the ability to, it was Diotimos, but the guards had no other choice. Diotimos was their strongest, most productive slave. As we prepared for our new assignments, we had no idea where we would travel, or how long we would be decamped from the valley. A few weeks, months, we could be away for years, or never returned at all. Considering the stronger slaves had been selected for the journey, we knew leaving our kin in the valley would put our remaining people under greater strains. I therefore felt sad to leave them behind but on the other side of my mind, I was eager to embrace the mysteries that lay ahead. Fighting Doc our dull-colored, hoodless tunics were woven from coarse materials, cut of a pattern that prevented us from covering our heads, intended to distinguish slaves from civilians. Although he had difficulty slipping his beautifully muscled body into his new dress, after rolling up his sleeves, Diotimos tugged on the grubby garment to remove the wrinkles and wore his undersized drape as if he had just been covered in a regal cloak. Although my eyes were telling me, it is just an ugly, poor-fitting slave drape, I knew Diotimos was eager to begin his new labors, believing he had earned this wandering opportunity through his ever-developing strengths. For had he been frail and futile, he would have still been confined to the valley, a buried seed that remained dormant, marred by infertility. Indeed, Diotimos regarded our new assignments as divine confirmation of the message bestowed upon him by Apollo atop the valley ridge that night, success is achieved only by those who wander around and are able to wait. Before setting sail in Roar, captain and crew began invoking guidance and safe passage from the god Poseidon, brother of Zeus and god of the seas, jockeying a fiery-winged horse, Poseidon wields his authority with a golden trident made from the alchemized bones of Cyclops, when angered, the deity punctures holes into the hulls of ships with his triple-pronged spear, killing captain and crew by sinking vessels to the bottoms of the seas, and when Poseidon is pleased, 
seafaring travelers are rewarded with calm waters and protection from piracy, while filling their nets with abundant supplies of sea life. Diotimos was particularly impressed with the oarsmen. Like all slaves, this specially conditioned group of captives possessed superior physical attributes to those of their overseers. The oarsmen were heavily muscled and rugged looking, and in spite of seemingly traveling the open waters, oarsmen performed their labors under hideous conditions. Galleys reeking with a noxious fusion of the scents of blood, vomit, halitosis, urine, feces, and sweat. Meanwhile, the scholars sat naked on coarse, concave and wooden banks and would perform thousands of rowing motions during each cycle, callousing their hands and blistering their buttocks while pumping up their already impressively muscular forearms, biceps, deltoids, trapezii, and latissimi dorsi. Showing off at the conclusion of our first day, when the oarsmen began to emerge from the galley after completing one of their long shifts, as they were covering their bodies in their soiled drapes, Diotimos stood off to the side observing the rowers' physiques. Since his sleeves were still rolled up to his elbows, several of the rowers believed the boy was trying to compare his muscles to theirs, and they immediately began to accuse him of mockery. But Diotimos was oblivious to the motives behind the sarcastic taunts, which only festered more animosity. As the crew continued to bicker about Diotimos, their head oarsman, a ruggedly muscular man named Tison, walked onto the deck and took notice. A lifelong slave who intimidated other men by showing off his large muscles, Tison owned the biggest biceps ever seen on any oarsman. He was often described as a centaur in reverse, his upper body having resembled a ball, and was known for cracking coconuts in the crooks of his elbows. Fists clenched and biting on his bottom lip, Tison quickly approached Diotimos. After cocking his arm back, Hisan then set a punch in motion, aimed directly at Diotimo's face. But the armed guards quickly intervened, stopping the bare-knuckled fist within a hair's width from striking Diotimo's in his jaw, and defusing a potentially bloody fracas. Fleets of vessels from delegations both near and far began to dock in the harbor as the Abydos militia served as guides and security. By the time we arrived, our course... Hoodless tunics were torn, and many were stained with blood, vomit, urine, feces, and sweat. Slaves from other lands, those who lived existences similar to ours, also wore disgusting drapes. Needless to say, all slaves were easy to recognize, even to the blind. But Diotimo's slave clothing was the only form of slavery he wore. The boy was thrilled to be on this journey, and in his heart, he knew slave was but a title assigned to him by another, an idiom his mind was incapable of comprehending. Once the wagons were loaded, mounted soldiers escorted the convoys to the Agra. The markets in Abydos drew a diverse assembly of proprietors, exchanging commodities through various forms of barter and trade. As we approached the city, the sounds of the Emporium grew exceedingly loud. Thousands of outlanders crowded the streets, dressed in distinguishing styles identifying their countries of origin, ideological tenets, social rankings, economic statuses, and political associations. As for us, median slaves were assigned to deliver our goods to various commercial enterprises while exposing us to the local palustra, sports arena, and theater. Diotimos was intrigued by the athletes and performers. As he had with the biceps on the oarsmen, the boy noticed unique physical and athletic differentiations developed from specific adaptations, like the plumped hamstrings and striated gastric on runners, rounded deltoids and tapered waistlines of boxers, and the brawny hip and gluteal development on wrestlers, to name a few. Especially fascinated by all the combatants who, in addition to numerous distinct physicalities, were easy to identify by their swollen ears. Diotimos immediately began to study the motions of the boxers, wrestlers, and pancreationists. He was already a master at baiting and leaping bulls. Now I sensed he was curious to test his skills against men. Quickly, I noticed Diotimos posturing his body differently. When he stood and walked, his head would gyrate and his shoulders would roll in weaving cross patterns. Two, he would position his body under the sunlight and flicker semi-closed fists, throwing punches at his own shadows. By sheer mental dynamics, Diotimos conditioned his neurological pathways to deliver nerve impulses that motioned his muscles in ways that were identical to those of the combatants he impersonated. Blown into the pit. It was like the wind had a coaxing mind of its own, or Apollo himself directed the drafts to put attention right onto Diotimos. On one particular occasion, 
a brisk breeze spread Iotimo's tunic, providing a lengthy glimpse of the impressive muscularity of his chest and abdomen. Those whose eyes were focused in the direction doubled back, some impressed, others feeling insulted by the boy's brash narcissism. Although the athletes were allowed to walk naked through the streets, the bodies of slaves were to remain completely shrouded at all times. Diotimos was oblivious to his unintentional provocations, to say nothing of his rolled-up sleeves, which had earlier fomented derogatory reactions from the oarsmen. Revealing his pectorals and abdominals had merely served to inflame the acute sense of instigation, and many of the proud men were determined to teach this new kid a lesson in respect. Seize that boy! An armed guard commands. Within a flash, six spear tips surround Diotimos within inches of his neck. Send him to the yard, the officer orders, and my younger brother is thus taken away. Annoyed by his mocking body motions, combined with the hubristic exposure of his muscles, Abido's security had Diotimos promptly arrested. Immediately, as we were accustomed to in Slave Valley, I thought Diotimos was going to be whipped for his behavior. I meanwhile struggled to ignore the possibility that he could also be executed for his actions. While the day painfully wore on, Diotimos had not returned, and as the aggro was closing, and the stall holders and patrons began to disperse, all of the slaves were commanded to rearrange the tables, and unload the wine and kumis from the wagons. After hauling the consignments across the roadway, upon approaching the exterior of a broad stone enclosure, I saw the gates of the palustra swing open. To my surprise, the athletic center was occupied with dozens of men, all in possession of smashed noses and broken teeth, and those distinctly identifiable swollen ears. The combatants were preparing their bodies for a pancreation eliminator tournament, sparring, grappling, and throwing one another to the ground. Positioned in the center of the yard, as I watched the men prepare for duels inside a makeshift enclosure, I found it obvious that the details in the Vidos were contrary to the despots in Slave Valley. These guards, along with many of the local patricians, fulfilled their jollies, and earned healthy side incomes, by staging fights between local and foreign slaves. Gazing toward the back of the palustra, I was instantly relieved of my tensions as I noticed Diotimos. Thankfully, he had not been whipped, yet he was totally undraped, now showing off all his muscles. The only straps that made contact with his body were the measuring ropes the guards were using to record his physical dimensions. As I kept observing my younger brother I watched him intentionally flex his muscles with exaggerated contractions, humored by the fact that showing off his physique was what got him arrested in the first place. Faster, and with greater fluidity, Diotimos weaved his body and punched his shadows. I knew then that he'd been selected to step into that makeshift pit and settle the conflicts he festered earlier. But with whom? Although Diotimos' maturing teenage physique was larger than that of the average adult man, on this day, not one of these men measured anything close to average, and all were indeed many years his senior. The selected men were large and tough-looking, and judging by the scars on their knuckles, lips, and brows, their cauliflower ears, crooked noses, broken incisors, and deformed fingers and toes, experienced fighters, as well. Before each contest, bat takers pace through the crowds to collect the wagers, as the double-handled papyrus baskets begin filling up, the sound of an infuriated voice arises from the side of the yard, match that dog against me, he son yells, my muscles are much bigger than his, and I will prove my superior size possesses superior power. Ever the crowd pleaser, the sarcastic and belligerent he son has turned all attention to himself. As a proven income generator, the slave oarsman understands the more savage the animosity, the loftier the wages fill the collection baskets and the greater he is favored by the guards and money men alike. Stepping forward with striated muscularity and protrusive vascularity in his giant biceps, this man, the very oarsman who earlier came within a hair's width of smashing Diotimos in the mouth with his knuckles, is now aggressively requesting to fight my younger brother who innocently showed off his muscles. Turning his attention to the betters, he son continues, Tonight you can earn a huge payout, place your highest bets on me, then enjoy spending your earnings on wine and women. Submission, or death. As with most every burden he had faced in his life, Diotimos approached the pit with a level of ambition that exceeded that of the first time he was commanded to jump into the pen and bake bowls, and I alone knew he would intensify that emotion by internally reminding himself, 
Only those who have the courage to face the fiercest battles will receive the greatest rewards. As they cast their bets, the crowds had begun sharing their opinions. The young slave is going to get his face smashed in. His son is the toughest slave fighter in the world, that kid just lost his life. My bets are on his son, just look at all the scars on his knuckles from the teeth he has broken. His fists are deadly, and he also kicks like a mule. I have watched his son practice his chokeholds by cracking coconuts between his flexed elbows, no wonder he has strangled many of his opponents to their death. No eye gouging, no biting, the acting hell Nidikai orders. Everything else, allowed. One round, no time limit. Fight to submission, or death. As the two fighters stand within arm's reach of each other, the combatants are introduced to the crowd. Pointing at Diotimos, the official shouts, Who bets on this slave boy? As the crowd unleashes loud boos and spits their saliva to the ground, the official then turns to the oarsman and heralds, his son. Now shouting praising chants, while fantasizing about how they are going to spend their earnings on wine and women, the official proceeds to introduce his son, their dockside combat hero. Undefeated in over a thousand fights, never once caught in the grip of a dominant hold, stake your wagers on his son, the toughest slave fighter in the world. After taking a step back, the official shouts, Apotea! Unleashing his pent-up aggression, the oarsman quickly initiates the action by extending his hand and snatching Diotimo's wrist. With a firm grip, his son leans backward while tugging on Diotimo's arm, causing a slight twist in Diotimo's shoulders. As Diotimo's is pulled forward, the oarsman cleverly throws an arm around Diotimo's exposed neck, quickly sinking in a chokehold. Caught in the grip of an arm that cracks coconuts, it seems certain Diotimo's is going to get strangled to death. As the seconds stretch into a long minute, I keep my focus on Diotimo's eyes, but he does not display any signs of panic. Instead, in what appears to be a feeling out period to calculate the oarsman's strength, Diotimo's begins twisting his head while jamming his elbow into his son's ribcage. As his son retains the deadly choke, Diotimo's continues pivoting his head, freeing his carotids from blood blocking compression while keeping his trachea clear from air restriction. Annoyed with the elbow blows into his intercostals, his son begins to stomp the top of Diotimo's feet. As Diotimo's shuffles his legs, the oarsman times a maneuver that hyperextends his body, quickly lifting Diotimo's off the ground. Within a flash, as Diotimo's back presses onto his son's chest, the oarsman intentionally drops onto his own back, using the force from the impact to tighten the chokehold. Diotimo's immediately grabs hold of his son's arm and begins pulling. With a slight gap between his neck and the oarsman's biceps, Diotimos snaps his body and spins into a mounted position. Unexpectedly finding himself pinned under the slave boy, a scrambling his son begins punching the sides of Diotimos' abdomen. As Diotimos lowers his body to avoid the punches, his son slides his hands downward and begins pinching the skin on Diotimos' hamstrings. Like with the chokehold, Diotimos remains poised, allowing the oarsman to continue to punch and pinch, a strategy that steadily drains the strength from his son's muscular arms. As his son continues to struggle, Diotimos reaches back with one hand to stop the pinching, and reaches forward with the other and places an open hand onto the oarsman's throat. With one arm restrained, his son reaches for Diotimos' genitals. Bucking his hips, Diotimos quickly tucks his testicles over his son's chest, blocking the oarsman's grip. As his son persists, Diotimos pushes his hand with a more violent force into the oarsman's throat. The hold locks his son in a state of total domination, causing the rapidity of his body's quivers to fade, then the whole of him to suddenly drop limp. The instant he feels his son fall unconscious, Diotimos releases his grip, pushes himself away from his son, and stands up. Embarrassed and humiliated, as he regains consciousness, his son staggers his way back to his feet and begins wiping the dirt off his body. But this man is not going to let a brass show off defeat him. So within a flash, Diotimos sees a fist flying toward his face, but dodges the blow with one of his earlier rehearsed weaving motions. As his son's fist crosses in front of his face, Diotimos grabs the arm, rotates the limb so its palm is facing upward, then yanks it onto his shoulder. Easily, at any second, Diotimos could snap this man's elbow and rupture the prime movers of his rowing actions. But instead, Diotimos proves to his son, and the crowds, that he has gained another dominant position. 
and after another tug, the oarsman cannot endure the pain, and, before his arm breaks in half, screams in submission. Tozy, the official shouts, spurring the betters into verbal accusations that the match was fixed. It is impossible that a man who cracks coconuts in his arms could not choke that kid unconscious. The boy got lucky. The oarsman just left the galley after laboring in the bank for hours. His biceps were surely fatigued. After Diotimos at last releases his hold, officially dethroning the toughest slave fighter in the world, a humiliated he son returns to the galley, arm bruised but still intact. Why not break my arm? He son asks as he later approaches Diotimos. You need that arm, Diotimos responds. If you cannot row your vessel, or earn money for your overseers, they will dismember your body and toss the parts overboard to bait sea creatures into their nets. You are not my enemy. We are brothers born from separate wombs. Keep faith. The day will come. He son nods to Diotimos, then honorably concludes, What we did today is the only way a slave generates favors from his owners. Godspeed my brother.